And I'm just going to say, hey, to all the poopers out there, you know who you are. Everybody, everybody poops. But we don't talk about it. Not only do we not talk about poop, we don't sometimes talk about waste, so-called waste in general. The verb, which has become a noun in English. What does that say about religion, nature, culture, our worldview, our understandings? That's what we'll be looking at today in this session. I'm so pleased to be joined by Dr. Sharon Moran and Dr. Elizabeth Allison. Their first slide has a little bit about each of them. And if you'd like to say anything more about who you are or how you come to this, please do. My name is Sarah Nahar. I'm a third year PhD student at SUNY State University of New York, College of Environmental Science and Forestry, where, as you can see, Sharon teaches, and she is my advisor. I'm very lucky. I also matriculate at Syracuse University in the Religious Studies Department, where Phil Arnold is my advisor. So we're first here from Sharon, then from Elizabeth, and then from myself. Sharon's presentation is entitled, World Without End, Religion, and Waste. Okay, the trick for avoiding the booms is having this tilted down, and we're going to roll. Okay, so our session is all about religion and waste, and generally, waste is the thing that's discarded, left behind, and unwanted. Our three talks today are about things literally thrown away by people in Bhutan, about shit people poop out everywhere and my talk about the waste that you are once you're dead, corpses. Please consider this a quick content warning about the topic, but if you haven't already been thinking about corpses in space, then you may not have been to the sessions here at this conference this year. Green burial is an emerging practice, and as of this month, six states have now legalized the composting of human bodies. While we aren't talking about a mass movement, at least not yet, many important shifts in practice start small. There are multiple terms that refer to the overall idea of a body decomposing on its own, and some distinctions refer to specific approaches, various strategies and methods of speeding that along. With this process of change in law and policy, it is also an important time to listen for the engagement of religious leaders and others in discussion about what this might mean for them. Statements illuminate emerging understandings. Religious communities may shut it down, or they may respond to this invitation for engagement or re-engagement with the planet, or both. The pace of change has been very quick. These legal shifts have all happened since 2019. During that time, we've had the pandemic, and in the US alone, that has meant 1.1 million deaths, more people dying at once than ever before. A main thing that religion does for people of faith is explain life and its end, death, and whatever comes next. So this topic is urgent for people to understand especially here in this gang of religion, nature, and culture people. So here's one measure of the rapid change in attitude. A 2021 survey measuring people's receptiveness to green burial showed that 11% of those queried were interested in natural decomposition without a casket, whereas just a year prior, that number was 4%. Last night, Winona LaDuke made a comment about the insanity of consumer society, and burial certainly illustrates this. The average cost for a funeral and burial in the US today is upwards of $8,000, and it's no surprise that there's a steady market for burial insurance, since folks are loath to saddle their family with these burdens once they have passed. That survey that I just mentioned was conducted by the Professional Association for the insurance people who sell that burial insurance. The typical practice, practices used for the deceased today in this country are phenomenally resource intensive. 
Burial of Bodies uses open land, often in perpetuity, making it spatially intensive and requiring constant maintenance of grass and more. The institutional arrangements for that often fall apart, especially with a mobile population that relocates frequently, and derelict cemeteries are a frequent challenge across the country. The main alternative to burial is cremation, and while it may consume little or nothing in terms of land, this process requires large quantities of fossil fuels, about 30 gallons, and once combustion has taken place, more than 500 pounds of carbon dioxide has been produced, and this is for a single body. Many other kinds of pollution get released during the cremation process, including heavy metal from coming from people's dental fillings, mercury. Now, when a body is simply buried into the ground, the process of decay and decomposition, breaking down the body's flesh, can take between six weeks and two years, depending on the soil type, the level of moisture, oxygen availability, the set of microorganisms present, among other things. And then there's bone, but that's still different. With typical American burials today, none of that happens because the process has been interrupted by various practices, starting with embalming, which uses formaldehyde and other toxic compounds, sophisticated caskets, which can be multiple layers of material, starting with a polyester satin lining, furniture grade hardwoods, ceiling gaskets, steel, and in case that wasn't enough, a concrete burial vault. What's new now is a couple of firms who have specifically been targeting the composting of human bodies, and they've been perfecting methods systematically that can enhance the speed and efficiency of the process and the usability of the product, the compost itself. One group doing this is called Recompose, and it's in Seattle, Washington. Much of their methods development was done by the founder and CEO in connection with Washington State University, Katrina Spade. She's the tallest person there holding the plant. She says, people want an option that aligns with the way they've lived their lives. They care about climate change and they want to leave a legacy that gives back to the earth. Another one is called Return Home. And this is the CEO, Mika Truman, saying, we shouldn't get airy-fairy about composting. Bodies are just squishies and hards. And he's standing there in his facility in Auburn, Washington. And you can see the first step in the unit is at the very bottom, and that's the wood chips, which form the foundation layer that the process starts out on. And here's another company called The Natural Funeral, located in Lafayette, Colorado. And the director says, Composting itself is a very living function, and it's performed by living organisms. There are billions of microbial living things in our digestive tracts and just contained in our body. And when our, life when our one life ceases, the life of those microbes does not cease. So he's there with his own self-designed container, which actually rotates to help speed and make the process more efficient. Now I want to quickly turn to some religious perspectives. First, we'll start with the statement of the executive director of the New York State Catholic Conference as our state was considering legalizing human compost a few months back. He said, human bodies are not household waste and we do not believe that the process meets the standard of reverent treatment of our earthly remains. He continued, Throughout human history, and in every culture, the disposition of human remains has followed a variety of rituals, but always involving internment or cremation. The process of composting is associated with the sustainable disposition of organic household or agricultural waste to be repurposed as fertilizer for gardens or crops. But human bodies are not household waste. They are vessels of the soul. 
Just as church teachings prohibit the scattering or dividing of cremated remains, it would not permit the spreading of composted human remains commingled with other organic matter to fertilize a garden. And that photo is of an ossuary in southern Poland. <clears throat> For Catholics who share concerns regarding care for the environment, numerous Catholic and other cemeteries in New York offer green burial areas that do not involve embalming, concrete vaults, or traditional coffins. So taken together, these statements reveal some acceptance of letting nature take its course, so to speak. But at the same time, the snide comment does reveal a rejection of the embrace of materiality of our physical selves. Still, I'm intrigued by his talk about human bodies as vessels of the soul, because this seems to invite the next step. Once the soul has moved on, doesn't it seem that other dynamics might now begin? His comments show a clear resistance to the idea of diminishing the, of bodily integrity. And still, he closes with a celebration of natural burials. Taken together, his comments reveal a complex engagement with the materiality of human composting. And this is important looking forward. From my first explorations of this new project towards some other religions, including different parts of Judaism, there has been both blanket acceptance and also rejection as well as sophistication in interrogating the materiality, spirituality, and integrity of these processes. These photos of the inside of Recompose help to underscore the fascinating layers of symbolism that are present here in this whole endeavor. Because I think probably all of us were in shopping malls at some point during the 1990s, and that hexagonal plastic surface kind of reminds me of something I saw while White Snake was playing on it music. Uh, so, in closing, what becomes of our bodies involves lots of material facts and details, but people's cosmologies tell us what it means for them. Changes and choices shift opportunities for revisions and deeper engagements. Religious leaders may respond to this invitation with more clear articulations of how their faith views the end and whatever comes next. Thank you. We'll take questions at the end, but I'm going to just invite you to stand up, shake, stretch, and then sit down again for Elizabeth's presentation. I don't know why we don't do this more academic conferences just to like take a breath in between presenters. We have enough time. I invite you to stand. You can close your eyes if you don't want anyone else to see you. Think with our whole body, so we want to wake them up again, especially since so it is Sunday of a conference. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. everyone. I'm Elizabeth Allison. I'm a professor of ecology and religion at the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco, California, where I direct the program in ecology, spirituality, and religion. And so for students and colleagues interested in this topic, I invite you to send them to us because we have a group of grad students focused specifically on the intersections that we're talking about here today. So I changed the title of my paper uh, slightly as I wrote it, and things do tend to develop. It's now called Wasting Shangri-La, Colonial Logics of Waste Production and Religious Refusal. As I was waiting for my plane on Thursday, just a few days ago, I opened a social media app on my phone and I saw the face of a suave Bhutanese movie star framed by wispy white clouds, his stylish hair blowing in the mountain breeze. And rather than extolling spiritual platitudes or a get-rich-quick tip, 
he was expressing his fervent hope and prayer that Bhutan would become a zero waste country. In the video, he asserted that this goal was possible and he believed Bhutan would achieve it. He invited the watchers to join him in this reality. And indeed, Bhutan has set the audacious goal of achieving zero waste by 2030. The video, transmitted through sophisticated communications technology, of course, demonstrated an ontology and epistemology wildly at odds with the colonial logics of waste production, which I will explain. The dominant technocratic perspective ar around waste assumes that technology and proper management can solve environmental dilemmas. In this paradigm, waste and pollution are necessary byproducts of industrial political economies of capitalist intensive production. Technological infrastructure and practices are then required to manage, contain, and transform pollution, as we already heard about actually, um, further enclosing and appropriating land, water, and air for sacrifice zones that serve as sinks where pollution is sent away. And we're, I think we're all familiar with this process of having something, discarding it, and it goes away. It goes to the landfill, right? As opposed to a more organic cycle of um, decay and uh, growth material decay and regeneration, basically, which we also heard about already. Um, and so this critique ar arises in the field of discard studies, which examines the social dimensions of waste. And that's the, the context for my paper here. So as we're all familiar, pollution requires identifying, designating, and creating sinks, places where human waste can go away. They can be away from our um, attention. We can ignore it. It's just all collected. These places. Um, their inherent in identity is sacrificed, while other places are also sacrificed for extraction for human desires. Inherent qualities of places are erased to be overridden by humans, like the creation of a terra nullius. As the Indian writer, anthropologist, and theorist Amitabh Ghosh writes in The Nutmeg's Curse, which is an amazing book if you're not familiar with it, I highly commend it to you. He writes, Colonization was thus not merely a process of establishing dominion over human beings. It was also a process of subjugating and reducing to muteness the entire, an entire universe of beings that was once thought of having agency, power of communication, and the ability to make meaning. Animals, trees, volcanoes, nutmegs. These mutings were essential to processes of economic extraction. Because, as the philosopher Akhil Belgrami observes, in order to see something as a mere resource, we must first need to see it as brutes, as something that makes no normative demands of practice and moral engagement with us." End quote. And so, in this idea, all of nature is reduced to something inanimate, unresponsive, and that allows extraction for human needs. And in enclosing and extracting materials and places for capitalist production, colonialism appropriates the spaces and life ways of subjugated others. As the waste and anti-colonial theorist Max Lebron um, writes, pollution is thus a property right. Pollution is something that we can do with property. So I've been thinking along with this amazing book of Max's uh, pollution is Colonialism, which I also commend to you if you're not familiar with it. Um, and this narrative of sending pollution and waste away is often accepted unquestioningly in industrial societies. The question is where and how to handle pollution rather than how it came into being and whether it should exist at all. So the Bhutanese movie star's prayer and proclamation aligns with a different ontology and a question that the waste theorist Max Lebron um, asks, why was not only the ability but also the imperative to pollute on the table at all? Like, why do we unquestionably accept this? And under what conditions does managing rather than eliminating environmental pollution make sense? So inspired by 
Liberon's 2021 book, Pollution is Colonialism, I take up this question and ask how religion and culture might contribute to challenging and denaturalizing this imperative to pollute. Well, contemporary high consumption industrial lifestyles assume and rely on a steady stream of cast off, short lived, non biodegradable materials, such processes are a modern invention created by a particular set of metaphysical views about the material world and humanity's relation to it. Particular epistemological practices allow us to know the world in some ways and not others, and specific economic, political, and ethical choices structure our social worlds. So these processes show up best in juxtaposition when a highly disparate context offers a foil that allows the particular contours of a situation to jump into sharp relief. So I'm um, offering Bhutan as a foil to our industrialized situation here. This paper brings colonialism, decolonial practices, technologies of various kinds and ways together through two episodes from Himalayan Bhutan where I've conducted an ethnographic field work and research since the early 2000s. First, Bhutan largely repelled settler colonialism by the British. While avoiding the grievous and material and spiritual harms of conquest, genocide, and expropriation of land, a lesser degree of colonial mentality crept in in the late 20th century. A shift in Bhutan's material culture resulted from the precipitous introduction of non-biodegradable manufactured products. With consumption colonialism, consumption practices shifted away from subsistence, thrift, and reuse to emulate those of the global north, to emulate our practices here. And secondly, I then examine how indigenous cultural resources generated alternatives based in culture and Vajrayana Buddhism to push back against this colonial consumption mentality. One aspect of the decolonial project is the praxis of learning from non-dominant cultures, lifeways, and epistemologies. Decolonial practices rely on and call forward the ontologies and epistemologies at odd with the dominant and dominating industrial, capitalist, extractivist ways of knowing and living in the world. Examining and learning from extant alternatives denaturalizes and deconstructs current systems and structures and helps lay a path towards different ways of engaging with the materiality of the world. So to Bhutan's history of colonialism, because I, I asked myself, well, can I even employ Lebron's uh, decolonial praxis in relation to this country that hasn't really, hasn't exactly been colonized? Um, settler colonialism never uh, gained a foothold in Bhutan, although during the 17th century um, age of colonial exploration and expansion, European visitors arrived in Bhutan seeking to spread Christianity across India and Asia and looking to reestablish connections with apocryphal Christian communities in Central Asia that they believed were there. Portuguese Jesuits uh, arrived in 1627 offering assistance from the Portuguese government, which the ecclesiastical king, the Jabdan Namgel, uh, Nawan Namgel, who had united much of Bhutan, refused. British explorers made incursions into Bhutan in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, and skirmishes with the British chipped away at Bhutan's territory along the southern border. Um, so much of the um, low elevation Himalayas around the southern border of Bhutan uh, with India have, have, were ceded to the British, which eventually became India. But colonizers did not establish permanent settlements in Bhutan. Sir Ashley Eden's travels in Bhutan in 1863 led to the classically colonial assessment of, quote, a country in which there is no ruling class, no literature, no national pride in the past or aspiration for the future. There is, as a matter of course, no reliable history and very little tradition, end quote. That was in his report um, to his superiors. But the history and tradition were illegible to him. Bhutan has maintained a uniquely continuous his history of religion and culture, having closed its borders to outsiders from beyond the Himalayan realm until the coronation of the third king in the middle of the 20th century. 
As Michael Aris, a noted historian of Bhutan, has observed, quote, there can be very few countries left in the world today whose present institutions are so faithfully derived from unbroken continuity with the past, end quote. After Indian independence in, um, oh yeah, after Indian independence in 1947, Bhutan and India signed the Indo-Bhutan Treaty of 1949. The treaty allowed India to guide Bhutan in external affairs and provided a subsidy of 500,000 rupees to Bhutan. At this time, the only other external development assistance Bhutan received was from the private funds of a Swiss industrial family, the von Schlusses, whose daughter had grown close to a woman who soon became part of the royal family during her studies in London in the late 1940s. Indian's Prime Minister uh, Jawaharlal, sorry, <laughs> always run over that one, Jawaharlal Nehru visited Bhutan in 1958, initiating a period of modernization through national road construction, creation of a postal service, and establishment of secular education with Indian support. Here he's seen riding on a yak. The Trade and Commerce Agreement of 1995 further updated and maintained free trade between the two countries. In the 21st century, around 90% of the exports from Bhutan went to India, the source of three quarters of all of its imports. And so, the intertwined economies of Indian Bhutan meant that Bhutan experienced the downstream effects from the liberalization of India's economy in 1991 when Bhutan's largest trading partner uh, allowed greater access to private and foreign investment, as well as international trade and imported products, the effects were felt strongly through the sudden appearance of non-biodegradable manufactured products in a context that had no ability to manage these exogenous materials. With new products came a new paradigm for human interaction with the material world. As Kunsang Choden, a well-known historian and author, recalled in an interview, quote, the problem happened suddenly, before there was no waste. There were only subsistence farmers. We got things from the garden and stored them in the basement and attic. Nothing was packaged. Now, the main waste from households is food and waste packaging. The change wasn't slow, it was just overwhelming. The availability of packaged foods came so quickly. There were no facilities, no preparation. People my age can remember when we didn't have soap. We used leaves and berries. Convenience is a seductive quality. And so these, the rapid introduction of, of plastics, non-biodegradable short-lived consumer products redefined social relations around things used in daily lives. Detritus from manufactured products was exogenous to the biodegradable circle of organic life, and it lacked qualities to inspire either care or revulsion. Much of it was abandoned in forests and waterways. Um, and a report from the uh, Royal Society for the Protection of Nature said that the Bhutanese had become, quote, voracious consumers by the early 2000s. Uh, the Society for the Prote Protection of Nature further wrote, quote, this has, this has led to a change in the type and quantity of waste generated at the individual, household, institutions, and community level. This consumerism has crept rapidly into society that has its origins in the rural traditional way of life. The needs and wants of the Bhutanese have changed from basic food and clothing to hi-fi packaged foods, fashionable clothing, household items, and entertainment." End quote. This implosion of plastic bottles, disposable products, colorful plastic packaging colonized minds and practices of daily life with their seductive ease and simplicity. This contrasted with the goods pr produced in the artisanal manner called Zorig Chusim that call forth concentration in their production and appreciation in their use. In previous centuries, nearly every item needed for daily life from baskets to clothing to buildings, had been attentively elevated to an art form, feeding the need for beauty as well as usefulness. These traditional arts and crafts were codified into the, quote, 13 traditional arts and crafts, end quote, also called Zorg Chusim in um, Bhutanese, in, the, in Zonka, the language of Bhutan. 
and they were uh, believed to have been established in the 17th century by one of the rulers who was also believed to have a sort of divine right of kings. The 13 traditional arts and crafts are drawing and painting, sculpture, paper making, calligraphy, iron casting, construction, so buildings, uh, masonry, carving, wood turning, blacksmithing, gold and silver smithing, tailoring, including embroidery and applique, and weaving. And so here you can see some of the products that were, were made for daily life um, that are really beautiful and artisanal. In defining the production of da daily necessities as art forms, the focused attention and concentration required for their creation comes to the fore, mirroring contemporary findings of cognitive science showing the benefits of concentration to a stable and content mind. In addition to connecting villagers to their past and to their religion, the emphasis on artistry created cherished objects which villagers established relationships with over time. Household items were created with mindful, focused attention to be beautiful, durable, and organic, representing and responding to the ecological conditions where they were created. Durability was prized over disposability. I, and then items that ceased to function as intended could safely be returned to the forest floor to become food for other beings. Artisanal household products could then become nutrients for medicinal herbs, animal fodder, and forest products as they decomposed. So the industrial, as I said at the beginning, the industrial production and consumption paradigm assumes a unidirectional flow of materials from raw materials to finished products that will eventually be thrown away when the end of their useful life is reached. The idea that materials require human attention only during a portion of their lifespan um, uh, co contradicts the persistent nature of many materials. This unidirectional paradigm of disposability and obsolescence contrasts strongly with Bhutan's previous closed loop paradigm of regeneration. Bhutanese villagers engaged in many other practices of discarding and revivifying materials, including thrift, refashioning and upcycling, sharing, composting, decomposing, making offerings, gifts, and ritualizing. And so in the 21st century, Bhutan began to wrest the narrative of waste away from this technocratic paradigm that had resulted in so much uh, litter and waste around the country back toward um, a paradigm that was more consistent with religion and culture. A renowned Vajrayana Buddhist teacher, uh, Tsongsar Jamyan Kensei Rinpoche, established a zero waste initiative with a comprehensive uh, rural sustainable sustainability project in the southern district of Samdok Jankar, one of the poorest uh, districts of all of Bhutan, which I've written about elsewhere. The project began in 2012 with the goal of initiating, quote, responsible and sustainable waste management practices, end quote, to protect the environment, enhance economic opportunities in the region, and promote sustainable and equitable social and economic development. And so, and this uh, sign again from social media, you can see the convergence of waste and religion in this Rinpoche's project um, with this advice to say no to plastic um, and as well as um, encouragement to meditation. Steeped in Bhutan's lineage of artisanal crafts and resourcefulness, as well as the Vajrayana Buddhist tradition of crazy wisdom that teaches through inverting hierarchies and toppling cherished norms, the Zero Waste Project provides education and support to help local producers create goods by reusing discarded materials. Adapting Bhutanese weaving techniques to new materials like strips from plastic bottles and plastic wrappers helped villagers identify as productive artisans and creators rather than consumptive disposers. Through close examination of discarded materials, Artisans can challenge the, Bhutani, uh, sorry, the Buddhist ills of attachment and aversion and deconstruct dualistic perspectives. Rinpoche encouraged that offerings at religious festivals be zero waste contributions and insert, asserted that with proper motivation, reuse crafting could become Buddhist practice. In an interview 
um, with Taylor Cass Stevenson, he said, quote, that I can confidently tell you, yes, especially in Mahayana Buddhism, all you have to do is have the right motivation and everything becomes practice, especially like zero waste, that is very wholesome, end quote. From the outset, the project exemplified the holistic relational awareness of the human connection to a range of sentient beings. A former project director with the project recalled, quote, before we construct a house, that ceremony we have when we seek permission from the deities who are actually the owners of the land. So knowing that we are just guests in this world, we have to be very, very mindful of our actions and their consequences. This consciousness is at the very core of zero waste. And without that, it's not going to be functional." End quote. So the practices of zero waste uh, reweave discarded materials back into the organic material cycle. Subsequently, in 2019, the Queen, Her Majesty the Giltson, um, and the National Environment Commission launched a campaign called My Waste, My Responsibility, and established Zero Waste Hour, coinciding with the Coronation Day of the Fourth King. Uh, Bhutan will observe this Zero Waste Hour on the second day of every month as a way to achieve the goal of the Zero Waste Society by 2030. During this hour, everyone in Bhutan will clean up their surroundings. In addition, the National uh, Waste Management Strategy, which revised the National Integrated Solid Waste Management Strategy of 2014, seeks to prevent waste generation to minimize waste to the landfill by focusing on refusing, first of all, reusing, recovering, and recycling waste and composting food waste. The Rinpoche Zero Waste Project, the Collective Zero Waste Hour, and the movie star's prayerful dedication to zero waste exemplify a decolonial approach to waste that draws on cultural and religious resources and values in establishing practices for discarded materials. Uh, these efforts restore discarded materials into the social cycle and respond to Max Lebron's challenge against the imperative to pollute, suggesting ways to work toward environmental, eliminating environmental pollution. Thank you. Once again, I invite you to just take a moment to stand, stretch, and if y'all would like to come over here, you're more than welcome to. That way it's going to be easier for us to have a conversation with you afterwards. That would be lovely, but yes. We're one more paper presentation. For those of you who've just arrived, uh, we heard first about human composting, or at end of life, um, different uh, religious understandings that get further or closer to uh, ways of biodegrading. And then, as you just heard, about a particular context and how they're wrestling with these issues and what it means. So, I'll just wait a little bit. So yes, yeah, people, liquid in, liquid out. This is what it's all about. I'll be speaking from here, and I do not have any slides. Um, can you remove your desktop? Bring the mic closer. Okay, yes, we are on now. Not, not that far, not that close, okay. Is that too much? All right, fantastic. Great, yes, please say hello to your neighbors. This is great, you're good. We'll wait for Sharon to get back. <laughs> yes, thank you for being here. Oh, not yet. There's one more paper, and then and then the mic will come around. Is that all right? Can we just give a round of applause to all of our tech people who've been working so hard in the back all weekend, looking us up, connecting us to the live stream. Hello for all you who are still watching on the live stream. Thanks for tuning in. So, 
I'm going to start by citing an article in 2016. And that year, 2016, many of us immediately think about the U.S. election. During that time, I heard the phrase, oh, U.S. politics are going to shit. And I wonder, what does that mean exactly? I mean, U.S. politics were never great, but the, yeah, the 2016 elections will go down in history. That's really shitty. So I wanted, I wanted to ask people what they meant by that. Do they mean it was disgusting? Do they mean it's worthless? It was terrible. It was to the bottom. It was, to, it was dirty. When something goes to shit, it seems to me, but would love to talk about what afterlives, if any, are imagined for that entity that goes to shit. This presentation is entitled, When Earth Goes to Shit, Defecatory Justice. So they're probably not imagining an entity that merges with others to rot or to be sanitized through a breakdown process or to be heated and composted or become another substance. Usually no, when, when something is imagined as going to shit, it's over, it's done, nothing more. So thinking about this conference after Earth or the, these next lives or these afterlives, Mary, uh, Mary J. Rubenstein and Sarah McFarland Taylor, they talked about this yesterday with you know, Musk and Bezos and, and returning to Marx too. Like it's easier to imagine the end of the world and to imagine the end of capitalism. It's easier to imagine the end of the world than thinking about dealing with our crap. So I'm just gonna share a little bit of ethnographies that I'm just beginning and thinking together uh, with particular groups of people who are seeking to imagine that there's a poop loop that's all connected, similar to that diagram that you just showed with it, that we all become food for others. So thinking about alternative systems to handle human urine and feces also is important ecologically as freshwater flush systems, while they do an excellent job of separating the humans from the pathogens are not a sustainable system for this planet. Anyway, this 2016 paper written by Caroline Glassberg Powell entitled Public Shit. Why is ecological sanitation not more ubiquitous in the developed world, she asked. She theorizes that this is because ecological sanitation technology tries to make an intervention without disrupting the fundamental paradigm of denying that we shit, that that is what leaves us in a trap. We deny that we shit, Glassberg Powell says. Vast water infrastructure is used to convey our excreta from the cities to, quote, nature. Our feces are not viewed as resources, but instead seen as waste and nu nuisances to be disposed. Ecological sanitation fundamentally questions this idea and serves to reconnect feces with agriculture. And two forms of research have, have emerged to address this paradigm. One is a hypothetical like life cycle assessment and others surveys user interaction with ECOSAN and they're both trying to trace how do we address the conundrum that is happening around freshwater flush not being sustainable. But neither approach in developing ecological sanitation has proliferated across the overdeveloped world. And Glassberg Powell's research is interested in why. For her, this is because all of these approaches are firmly entrenched in a technocratic viewpoint of infrastructure and control, which simultaneously denies that we should. So she takes issue with attempting to disrupt sanitation from within the very paradigm that needs to be deconstructed. And unless we fundamentally acknowledge that our bodies are leaky, messy, ooze from every orifice, ecological sanitation will always remain in the domain of the hippies. We can see behind some of these technocratic viewpoints of infrastructure and control, some impacts of Christian hegemony throughout. I won't go into many of those now, but that type of worldview produces a certain type of crapper, Thomas Crapper and the others. This denial has a lethal impact worldwide, which is one of the things that brings me to this topic. Without a willingness to talk about poop, it's difficult to address the sanitation crisis. This was uh, documented uh, also as they tried to address the AIDS crisis. Very difficult to do without being able to say the word sex. 
without being able to say the word shit or poop or feces. English doesn't have a really neutral term, although the etymology of the word shit goes back to simply to separate. Shindir. So I'll use a variety of words throughout the paper. Please bear with me. Here. So, two out of five people, though, around this world do not have access to a safe way to urinate and defecate. And in the overdeveloped world, there's also a crisis here because of disproportionate water usage and toilet technologies have extreme environmental consequences, combined sewer overflows and the algal blooms. That but in much of North American society is considered impolite to talk about waste and reclamation projects in academia around the body and, and embodiment they don't often focus on the body's grosser, oozier, more mucusy like stuff. Talk about the sexy stuff, right? So, so this has been somewhat overlooked. It's fun doing a literature review, really trying to find where have people talked about poop in the past. Furthermore, again, the Christian hegemonic religious public's general discomfort with focusing on what is produced by human bodies has further sidelined it. And even in movements like food studies, the radical intersectional way of trying to understand how we're a part of these food systems. The emphasis is on the political economy of food until the point of consumption by the human. So what about the back end of food studies? In addition to kind of a collective denial or desire not to focus on that, there's also some structural oppression that permits the separation politics and infrastructure and some religious concepts beyond Christianity around uh, purity, danger, Mary, to use Mary Douglas phrase, and uh, wanting to think about what pollution and to make sure that that is separated, not only in a non-ultimate way, but perhaps an ultimate way has given us an inability to, to wrestle with what is still here with us. However, some religion's self-understanding is helping people cultivate awareness, acceptance, and connection to all that is, was, will be. So I just wanna have, make a nod here to Judaism and to the Haudenosaunee, and then I'll focus a little bit on some Mennonite and Catholic liberation ecologists through this lens of defecatory justice. Um, defecatory justice is a framework that examines the power dynamics at play when addressing the global sanitation crisis as a religious and climactic issue, and it cares about the people involved, the poopers, as well as the nutrient-rich material itself, the poop. I have not yet used defecatory justice to analyze NASA's space poop contest, but they do have one, and I've been thinking a lot about it during this conference as well. Um, even though I, like, I need to ask Sarah McFarland to text Elon Musk to ask him what he thinks about poop in space. Um, because surely they're talking about it and thinking about it, and. NASA is one of the agencies that's like most ahead and working on that, but we can't even quite deal with it here on the planet. But they, it's an absolute imperative in space. As I argue, it's an imperative here as well. But they have designed a number of, of toilets, uh, which, you know, not unlike that airplane toilet that you all may encounter as you travel home with the vacuum. You know, there's all sorts of, with space, since space is already a vacuum, it's, also, it's, it's quite a cool contest. So, for the first example of religious connections, there's etymological connection between the word bowels and compassion in Biblical Greek. And so when sometimes compassion is translated from Greek to English in the text, it's to be moved in the inward parts. Or these questions about gut feelings and, and connections to our minds and and how our guts make us move in the world and how our, the movement of our bowels signifies uh, life force. In Judaism, the Asher Yatsar blessing is a prayer recited upon leaving the bathroom. It's part of the prayers that come or the blessings that are generally offered upon waking up. So the first moment that the eyes open, the first moment the feet touch the floor, and then pretty soon the bathroom blessing comes. That's often the progression if you're regular, you know. Uh, so, but this blessing, blessed are you, right? Adonai, our God, ruler of the universe, who has formed humans with wisdom and created us with openings and hollows and tubes, 
It is clear in the presence of your glorious throne that if one of these were ruptured or if one of them were blocked, as in if the tubes that were closed were open, or the tubes that were open were closed, we would have a problem. It would be impossible to stand before you and praise you for any length of time. So blessed are you, Adonai, who heals all flesh and, and acts wondrously. A prayer of gratitude, a prayer of recognition. And a nod to the Haudenosaunee, Six Nations folks up in Canada, um, when visiting, doing a delegation of resistance to environmental racism that, ha that had happened there, uh, this uh, First Nation leader challenged a group of Christians and said, you Christians say, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And we say yes to that. But we have also recognized that humans aren't the only ones in the flow. It's deeper than that. We say, do unto those downstream as you would have those upstream do to you. North American Mennonites, many of whom are descendants of 16th century separatist movement of the Radical Reformation, have a prevailing pacifist theology and praxis. And so, as the um, Mennonite Central Committee, their, their Sustainable Development and Relief and uh, Disaster Response Group, published just last year, a picture of a woman on the, on the front of their magazine called The Commonplace, holding a bucket full of cow dung on her head. She had a big smile on her face, and the quotation was about the ways in which she was using this dung to create biofuel. This is the first time in the research that I have done where we see poop on the front cover. It's not human, but it's cow. And there's a recognition that there's a cycle here that can be very useful towards a circular economy. And this comes after a long time of Mennonites working on building appropriate technology. So an intervention, while not having built many composting toilets, many groups around the world, including Mennonites, have built latrines. So there's been some connection around this question of sanitation, but still with a more European, European American model about how to simply contain feces and urine rather than reincorporate. However, with this um, December 2022 commonplace publication, poop has now entered another level of the conversation. It's only February 2023, so don't know where that's going yet, but stay tuned. Also, another Mennonite pastor I want to highlight, Rihanna Isaac Krause, works on these questions from the pulpit. Speaking about uh, the, the great feast and banquet that was a parable within Jesus' message, Rihanna preached the sermon, the great meal, then what? In it, she helps people think through the holiness of the digestion process, how food is interacting with my microbes. Rihanna integrates this conversation within a broader framework of watershed discipleship and environmental ethics, thinking about the ways in which we as human animals have an opportunity to not double deplete our watersheds. Most animals take in food from their watershed and they poop and they return any excess nutrients to that watershed. But given that we as humans are eating from many different watersheds and then flushing it towards another watershed, usually via river systems and wastewater treatment, etc., we double deplete. What might be the process, she asked, in watershed discipleship if we figure out how to return our excess nutrients to that space? She further, in other uh, of her work, invites people to think about uh, poop, dealing with poop as grief work. I mean, that's the old you, she says. It's what's come through you. It's what you're leaving behind. She also engages youth, asking questions to them like, will there be poop in heaven? Why or why not? The youth begin to think about their conceptions of what is beyond what they can see, feel, think, hear, smell, taste in this space, in, in that particular cosmology. She pushes even further asking a time, a time honored question that was debated by many theologians way back in the day, did Jesus poop? 
What does it mean to be human? How this is a big question of Christology, interacting with Greek philosophies around how the body uses energy, as well as other Mesopotamian area philosophies on um, what it means, again, to be human. Finally, I'll sum up. She says, if as most Christians profess, God loves life on this planet, and if that life is in peril, then our theology will need to reflect this. We are called after all to minister to the sick and millions of people around the world are getting sick because of poor sanitary conditions. The most compassionate way to help the sick is not only treat the symptoms, but also change the st structures that sanction sickness. So here we're seeing some ways in which this is combining um, with an understanding of mutual aid, another uh, strong Mennonite value, as well as challenging the violence of our system that has separation politics, not only of us from the consequences of our actions, but people from each other. So that's the last, last piece I'd like to speak about is a challenging violence aspect and the, the pacifist aspect and how defecatory justice, I'm, I'm reading that, that this is a, a defecatory just response because it is looking at a way to connect issues of climate change mitigation and adaptation efforts with nonviolence projects. And this is particularly important because climate crises, as we know, are seen as intercommunal conflict accelerators. Furthermore, as we have seen um, around the world, and just yesterday I got alert about uh, there's another cholera outbreak, not dealing with our shit has lethal, co has, has, has consequences for public health. And so as a climate change adaptation, um, the, the shift will need to happen. And it's not simply a matter of reinventing the toilet Bill Gates style, which is again, a very technical response, highly uh, technical machines, but, but sim simple ways of reintegrating safely, both urine and feces, which are actually two different substances. Urine being quite sterile, can be reintegrated one way and poop another. So Mennonites were getting together to ask who is downstream of us? What are they experiencing metaphorically or literally from our disposal heavy society? And what does it mean for us to flush our discarded resources onto them? Furthermore, many refugees have left their homes because there's not access to water. And since Mennonites are concerned about preventing war and forced human migration, the solution to sanitation issues can not only be to provide everyone a flush toilet or expand a model based on the global Norse underground system, that requires a steady volume of water. Catholic liberation theologians, um, very much inspired by the Catholic worker tradition of nonviolence, anarchism, and personalism, as well as the permissions of Vatican II. Some of their reframes have involved uh, working for s solutions to the challenge of sanitation that come from those living at the margins, which is a similar way of reading the biblical text in liberation theology, looking for ecological solutions at those same margins. Because they say, mostly focused on the work of Sarah Burnell and Sasha Kramer here of Soil Haiti. Um, they say solutions that are accessible for people on the margins tend to work for everyone, whereas solutions that work, from the, that work for the center tend to be inaccessible or impractical for those living on the edges. So those who are the most threatened and marginalized human beings, they generally live in similarly threatened ecosystems. And so to close the protection gap, Sarah and Sasha look to the unprotected and learn from their leadership on how to restore their environments by transforming dangerous pollutants into valuable resources. Some communities struggling with open defecation issues, for example, have become have begun community-led total sanitation initiatives or container-based sanitation initiatives. And those are now networks around the world to look at a community's own appraisal and analysis of their current waste systems and practices, and then work to design the ideal and assess the existing and needed resources to maintain the desired infrastructure for community change. This is really important because it's not a top-down approach. Um, and it allows community insiders and outsiders together to implement action steps suggested by local models. So there is a type of insider-outsider interaction, which really builds on that personalism aspect um, from Catholic liberation theologians that it, it's me and you, it's us together. We solve this, um, we address this, as well as it recognizes a decentralized approach. So not one size fits all um, as we address sanitation.
just want to give a shout out to Soil, which since 2006 has been operating in IT, Haiti, and they provide household customers with access to safe, dignified sanitation. And they use a locally sourced organic cover material, and this is, in this case, it's discarded resources from sugarcane and peanut processing. They use that in place of the water flushing, and then they use locally manufactured um, sealable containers for the solid waste. The buckets are collected weekly and then washed and recirculated. And each customer receives a, a ceramic loo that goes outside the bucket and that also assists with urine diversion. The waste is then collected and then transported to one of soil's waste treatment sites where through heat and it is transformed in compost through a carefully monitored process that includes thorough lab testing. Then the finished compost is sold as an effective soil amendment. And plants grown in soils compost have helped reforest and stabilize Haiti's environment. And um, farmers which have used this compost have documented over 15 to 30% bumps in yield. So um, those plants in turn that the farmers plant provide nutritious organic food for people to eat and then excrete, completing the ecological loop. So this is one business model and there are others around the world that are picking up on this business model. And innovation on this issue, however, it turns out in, in the United States, in many places it's illegal, not entirely in rural areas. And there have been groups therefore that are beginning the work at the municipal code level to allow for experiments in closed loop sanitation. So in conclusion, some questions that I'm chasing through all of this. What cosmologies make it possible to create a freshwater flush system to start with? Back in like the 1880s, 1890s, there was this like close debate between the water closet and the earth closet. And the water closet just barely edged out. But it hasn't been forever since we've been pooping and peeing like this, just since 1880. But what happened at that moment and what is possible now? Again, through that maybe technological bridge. What cosmologies allow for other safe ways of reintegration? And so thinking with Glassberg Powell, how much does our worldview need to shift in order for the large scale tech to shift? Will the denial of pooping in the US ultimately truncate efforts? What are the possibilities for defecatory or excretory justice to be integrated with other food justice concerns and social and ecological concerns writ large? Can only animist or new animist worldviews allow us to really embrace ecological sanitation? Can normative religions only get us so far for the, for the people who are thinking about this transformation? Or can the changing technology that refuses denial make us deal with our crap? Could that be a bridge to help us do the worldview world shift needed to stop denying that we shit? Thanks. All right, one more time, have a stand up. <laughs> you may just chat with someone beside you about something you've learned or some, some thought. I do this a lot in the classroom so, I, so that we don't just go right to questions. But feel free to greet the other poopers around you, the people who are future human compost. <laughs> All right, cool. Great. I'll let them talk a little bit to each other. Fantastic. Well, thank you for engaging with all, all three of these materials. And the mic is here. I'll bring it around if you have a question. Feel free to ask it or a thought or a suggestion. Uh, thank you all for a very rich presentation. I was thinking of the exclamation, holy shit, you know? Um, and the, some of the first places I actually heard people talking about shit as sacred were in grassroots uh, environmental and social justice movements around. And that's often because they have encampments where they have to figure out what to do with their shit. And if they didn't know beforehand, they figure out that 
um, if you compost this stuff, even with human feces, it, it may take longer than garden vegetables, but there's still a magic that's happening there. Um, so many of the world's religions are, are really in profound ways trying to deny death. And they're trying to deny human animality. And they're really ideologies of human supremacy. And I think all of this is kind of entangled in the way we think about our own bodies and our own deaths. So uh, you probably know uh, about Gary Snyder, who was one of the first, you know, the, the, the Buddhist American deep ecologist, activist, and Pulitzer Prize winning author of the remarkable book, Turtle Island. And in his writings, it was one of the first places I had encountered this idea of um, sooner or later, we're all part of a meal and it's all a sacred process. And you were alluding to that, some of you. Um, and then I think about uh, the Robinson Jeffers poem. Do you know this one, Vulture? Oh, oh look it up, G Google Vulture. Uh, and the Zoroastrians would put bodies in trees and the crisis of biodiversity with the decline of vultures in the, ancient, in, in the Near East occurs with the uh, hegemony of uh, Islam in that area, which extinguished, for the most part, that kind of practice. Some Native American nations also let their bodies go in trees. And so the, uh, many of us have been very much moved by that kind of idea that we're a part of it and we've got to just accept that. As a, as a surfer, I know that I've never heard a surfer who's been hit by a shark blame the shark. It's like we're a, there's, there's this kind of assumption, we're a part of it, and if that's the way we go, that's, that's a good death, right? So I'm uh, delighted at these movements about uh, composting bodies, um, but another, another thing that's, that hasn't been talked about is the idea of becoming part of other beings, maybe not uh, composting is one way, but also by being eaten by, by others. Uh, anyway, it's a very rich panel, and those are just a few ruminations on this. But within the kind of global environmental milieu, what you're talking about here is one of the kind of central pillars of this, you know, neologism that I just called dark green religion, which is just to kind of capture the convergence of kind of naturalistic nature spiritualities around the world. And this is an element that's really quite common and has cultural traction and continues to spread. So anyway, thank you for a, a really rich panel. Thank you. Enjoyed it. learned of it as a, as a younger person and now I have more familiarity with death and I have become perhaps less enchanted um, but it's usually reserved for very high llamas because it needs to be a, a sort of enlightened substance that's going up into the the vultures with the sky burial but there's a whole practice um, I, I didn't get into it very much but Vajrayana Buddhism tries to overcome aversion uh, especially to these substances that, that we don't like. Um, and, um, and I think there's a Hindu tantric um, practice similar. Um, and so one way to overcome that aversion is to be around and deal with dead bodies. Um, and there are um, particular monks who are actually tasked with dismembering the bodies in preparation for sky burial. I heard an amazing paper on that um, in Bhutan actually this fall, which would have been a really interesting <laughs> connection with this topic. But I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty gory, you know, like you can't really, but the point is to overcome our feelings of aversion about that goriness. Wow. Yeah. So, thanks for bringing that up, Ron. Good morning, panel, and thank you so much. I am very excited about this conversation about waste. Um, I wanted to uh, ask uh, 
mainly how do you see um, in other words we all of you in a different way said that the problem is uh, the embeddedness of our practices when it comes to ignoring waves um, how do you see uh, or what types of interventions I should say do you think are possible when it comes to religious groups uh, both in terms of their intention to intervene but also kind of an intervening in the in the ideologies and the commitments and the truth claims that keep things the way they are One intervention that I have been impressed with is when the sanitation crisis is talked about, there's often the first thing on many people's mind is that there is open defecation. That's the problem. There's poop and then poop gets on fingers and toes and pathogens. And <clears throat> one of my interlocutors talked, who had worked in Ladakh, Harpreet Singh, talked a lot about how in India before the British, people could go out in the morning to the jungle, have a walk, defecate. And the jungle with its multifaceted, biodiverse, multi-layered, full ecosystem was able to receive the poop and pee from the person. The person made their journey back. When the British come and chop down on your jungles, and then plant rows of pine trees, and you continue in your ancestral, rhythmic, healthy practice, all of a sudden, your poop does not decompose, and now you have an issue of open defecation. So the intervention that I hear people making is, the solution to the sanitation crisis is not simply more toilets, it's decolonization. And so by putting something that is often considered a half taboo public, public health issue or in the wash sector, very much in the central sector around violence, power dynamics, justice, and self-governance. That, while my, maybe not a worldview shift, is a, is a discourse and narrative intervention that has been very meaningful. And so then also on the way towards decolonization or anti-colonial efforts, then let's not leave behind. That, that, that all of our body's processes are important as we get free. So that's, that's one that I've appreciated. And um, she's coming from a, a Hindu background that also is addressing caste and addressing the impact of the ways in which people who deal with dead bodies and, and poop, which are often the same people, are often considered less than in society. So those are double, triple interventions that I've seen from her. I guess I'll add on one more thing, and that's the fact that at death, it's one of the top times for people to consult with religious leaders or pastors. So right there, there's that opening and opportunity. There's a conversation that's probably taking place about what will happen in several ways, materially and spiritually. So I think that's probably a place as well for that engagement. and building on what Bron raised, um, that certainly many forms of Christianity um, teach us to move away from the body, right? And, and value and prioritize the soul and the spirit and the, the, um, you know, the future is what matters, not the here and now. And so that has so many consequences that have been deconstructed by feminists and ecofeminists and, and womanists and so many different kinds of theorists um but but all of this is about bodies mattering in time and space and not only human bodies but animal bodies and plant bodies and microbial bodies because we need them to break down the poop and break down the other organic matter uh, but i think you know most of the time we're so in industrial society we're so 
disconnected from that and both our science and religion teach us to be disconnected from that. So Sarah's intervention to have us stand up and stretch like right there, that's, that's making a qualitative difference in these kind of academic panels where we're normally a head on a stick and, like, and Sarah invited us to be bodies and that's awesome. Um, so I think like the, the decolonial praxis and the, um, the sort of liberatory praxis that invites the whole person to participate in whatever is, is happening you know, with the various qualities and with the various abilities and with the, the histories and the traumas that they would bring to the situation. Um, I mean, obviously that's a long and, and slow process, but at the same time, I it really connected with what Sarah said that in terms of, of decolonization and decolonizing our minds and our practices, like that's, that's um, a part of how we deal with everything, which includes how we deal with waste. Yeah, I, thank you for your, um, Sarah, for your shitty presentation. <laughs> I, I can't resist. Um, yeah, just a couple quick things. One is um, in relation to like the absence of jungle and the, and the possibility of uh, using that as an outlet for defecation, that certainly seeing that in a decolonial aspect is probably a good lens. But I, I, the first thing that comes to mind for me is that's, that's a rewilding issue. Yes, sure. Yeah, that jungle was there, it's gone, maybe it should be brought back. And so my initial thought to hearing a lot of this, that ties into my deeper thought, which Bron kind of brought up, but as a very avid outdoors person, um, I find that when I'm out, I have a very intimate relationship with my waste, but it's also very a liberatory relationship. It's like, I gotta go, okay, look, <laughs> here's my toilet and I just dig a hole and it'll leave no trace since but for me there is this like connectedness that i get and that's part of the draw mm -hmm. of that and so um on the note of rewilding i feel like mm -hmm. going into a wild space for me yeah. connects and when i'm out with people in that space um i find that the topic of shit is one of the most prominent topics and so i am very com comfortable and actually really like moving into a scatological yeah. space and um and the last thing I'll point out is um, some like really prominent wilderness thinkers like Thoreau and Edward Abbey are also very open in their writings about this topic. And so I think there is maybe something like inherently liberatory about certain wild spaces that um, leads to some comfort and blatant acknowledgement and even joy in this topic. So um, that's my two cents on that. <laughs> I thank you so much. Yep. And especially in the way that, I, that the wild in me and the wild feels like such a dynamic contrast to the domesticated intensity spaces that we are a part of. Uh, the ability to talk openly about a taboo subject also is probably invigorating that sense of like, yeah, like this is really happening. To be able to speak the truth of one's experience from poop to the other things in life that are often start to become less welcome can happen in wild places and uh, outside of some of, some of the boxes. And so for that reason as well, um, once you've talked with someone about, you know, your excreta, like what else is taboo? You know, your heart is open, you're just gonna, you know, like, it's just, it's a, it's a moment which, um, well, I guess I'll just say maybe we become human in a different way or the more returning home way. So thank you for that. And it, yeah, from that pre from when uh, the 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 bishop that you quoted spoke about, um, you know, it's not household waste. The body used to be treated reverently. My question is, and why don't we treat household waste re reverently? And so that connected with with what you're saying. But this increase in reverence also, uh, when we have. Um, a perspective of ourselves, a part of it all, smaller than the trees, and we're in proximity enough to see them and, and connect. All, all of these things um, can come to the fore. So, um, yeah, thank you for your testimony. Perhaps some kind of inverted communion. A. Hey. Yes. Focus on the, on the back end. Yeah. yeah. We, are, we, are, we are the body. We are the blood. We are the this form of, of rewilding that returns um, human excrement to soil could also be a way 
that humans contribute positively to the world. So much of the environmental movement is about all the scourge that humanity is, uh, all the harms that we create, which are undeniable. Um, but we've also separated ourselves from the rest of the world, and and we have then this this negative narrative. But we don't very often focus on the benefits that humans contribute to the natural world, including the nutrients that are in human waste. There's a lot of nutrients in human waste. Of course, we know that uh, cow manure is used as a great fertilizer, um, but somehow that gets separated from whether human manure can be used as a fertilizer. And of course, there's, there's questions about uh, pathogens and stuff, and it has to be properly composted. But there are uh, human manure composting uh, efforts, experiments, and this is a way to reconnect, to say like we, our bodies are made of nutrients. Soil and plants need nutrients, and as you were saying, nutrients need to return to the soil to feed other beings, both through our excrement and, and at the end of our, our lively existence to return our nutrients to the soil um, to, for another being to take up that lively existence. So I feel like it's a way of participating in the world uh, that that in industrial society we don't do so much. So we'll just have one one last piece and then, then we'll be here and if not we'll see you in the bathroom. So <laughs> we'll keep it on going. Yeah. Last one. Last word. Did you want the last word? Um, if anybody else says I have a little gift I can give you yeah. in, in uh, to reciprocate for this wonderful panel. Vulture by Robinson Jeffers. Mm -hmm. I had walked since dawn and lay down to rest on a bare hillside above the ocean. I saw through half-shut eyelids a vulture wheeling, uh, its orbit narrowing. And presently it passed again, but lower and nearer, its orbit, its orbit narrowing yet. I understood then that I was under inspection. I lay death still and heard the flight feathers whistle above me and make their circle and come nearer. I could see the naked red head between the great wings bared downwards, staring. I said, my dear bird, we are, you are wasting time here. These old bones will still work. They are not for you. But how beautiful he looked gliding down on those great sails. How beautiful he looked veering away in the sea light over the precipice. I tell you solemnly that I was sorry to have disappointed him. To be eaten by that beak and become part of him, to share those wings and those eyes. What a sublime end of one's body. What an ensconment. What a life after death. Thank you and have a wonderful break. Thank you.